So hello everyone. Um, to be inclusive, my self-description is that I'm a light-skinned woman with dark hair in an office. So a little about me, as was mentioned, I'm a data engineer, have worked with Airflow, and very excited to talk to you about it. So with that, let's get started. So the topic of code organization is not talked about uh, very often, but extremely important when initially incorporating Airflow into your data platform. So there isn't just a growing mountain of technical debt. Uh, when there are just a couple DAGs, it's very easy to remember where everything is defined. However, this can change very quickly uh, when scaling. So let's talk about scalability, scalability a little bit. Whether it's initializing a data stack at a startup that will scale with a business or integrating a new data tool into a large company and transitioning all existing processes into it, uh, scaling is important and just will inevitably happen. The key for your, team to, for your team is to scale efficiently. So what exactly do I mean by that? When technical workloads grow in size or complexity, there is a growing amount of time needed to devote to these processes. The question is really about the relationship uh, between complexity and time. Scalability is the ability to scale most efficiently by having growth and complexity amount to a smaller and smaller growth in time to implementation. So actually a short shout out, Abe Gong, co-founder of Superconductive, actually talks about this relationship between complexity and time in the context of data tests. But now let's talk about how this relates to using Airflow. So what does scaling Airflow mean? Um, scaling Airflow means increasing the number of workloads running. But with that, uh, infrastructure must adjust as well as growing a growing code base for, for all the jobs actually running. There are many other great talks scheduled to discuss infrastructure, actually um, like the talk uh, the running on running Airflow on Kubernetes on Friday, uh, which I will certainly attend. But today I'll focus on the code base. So the primary question that I'll be answering is, how do you make your code base not a nightmare to read through or debug? So first, let's go through the exercise of what not to do. Uh, consider you open up your favorite code editor. I'm personally partial to VS Code, so that's kind of where these screenshots will be coming from. But say you're a new team member who joined the team, and on your first day, you dive into the code seeing this file. I know the text is small. There's a lot going on here. You see a few functions. You're not completely sure how they tie together. Then you, you scroll to the bottom of this long-ish file and you happen to see that this is actually a DAG file. So this DAG is named stock retrieve and you see that the functions implement getting stock data from Yahoo's finance API. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, but more specifically, it's hard to understand how files are named as they don't really represent their contents. Second, there, there's business logic as well as tool specific code in one place. And as someone who understands Airflow but might be new to the business, this may be confusing. Lastly, if you're unfamiliar with Airflow, then the DAG and task declarations coded at the very bottom may be the confusing part. And you can also imagine that the default args that you see are coded over and over and over again in all of the DAG files. So what problems does disorganization actually pose? So first, someone must be an expert of the business, Airflow, and any other tools to review a pull request. They must either become an expert in all of these things, or if they're only an expert in one, scan through the parts of the code they don't understand somewhat mindlessly, which may impact their ability to review what they are actually interested in once that part of the code appears. Next, if you look at the Airflow UI, to understand what code actually ran when, it's like guessing a number between one and 10 and just hoping you got it right. There's no clear link between DAGs and the actual code contributing to them. This link may be even harder to find in a high pressure situation when a pipeline is broken and you're in the state of debugging. So going off of the first point, it's hard for someone to review, which also means it's gonna be hard for someone to add to. If any sort of change is requested, every subsequent change is just going to be exponentially more time consuming to add than the prior. So this is exactly how technical debt accumulates and technical debt goes directly against scaling effectively. 
The concept that I'd like to hone in on today is dry code. So dry standing for don't repeat yourself. This can apply to copy pasting functions you use across DAGs or code specifically interacting with Airflow in Python. So consider the game of broken telephone. You have a bunch of people and the first person says something and then everyone in order repeats what they heard from the previous person in the chain. The whole reason it's a game is that usually the last person gets a message completely different from the original. So in the context of the game, it's hard for someone to hop in and it creates a huge misunderstanding. This is just like the code architecture that we walk through. So in the game, the misunderstanding is, is funny, which again is why it's called the game, but it's not funny when it's in your professional life when the stakes are significantly higher. Now, a more specific example, just to hammer the point home. So consider the below functions, which are supposed to calculate the Unix timestamp of 7, 14, and 21 days ago. So there are two bugs here, both on this line and both potentially hard to spot under a high pressure situation. Instead, a single function can be called that takes an input of the number of days back on which to calculate the timestamp. Broken telephone, again, it's all fun in games until it's your actual situation. So bringing it back to the topic at hand, scaling airflow, we'd like the code to be more intuitive by organizing it, segmenting it, and not repeating ourselves. So what does that actually look like? I'll introduce three key aspects of code organization. Structuring folders and files in a way that's intuitive for any new team member, first. Second, consolidating code to generalize it over several use cases. And lastly, keeping tool specific code in one place. So let's dive in. When a DAG fails, there can be a scramble to debug it and fix the underlying issue. If the folder structure represents the Airflow UI, this process can be made much easier. Consider we have three DAGs. They are just examples, so honestly, even the DAGs, the DAGs themselves here could be named better, but let's go with, with these examples. So the below folder structure is easy to navigate. We have one folder per DAG with business logic under a separate folder than the file actually declaring the DAG and the tasks. So moving on to code consolidation, consider there to be several DAGs that involve fetching Unix timestamps, for instance. We could arbitrarily put the generalized function we came up with under a particular DAG, but again, this would be completely arbitrary. Instead, I suggest having a general utility folder of sorts. So in this folder, we can have files, functions, classes, you name it, um, that are generic pieces of code used across multiple DAGs. It could be manipulating timestamps, interactions with a Postgres database, or boilerplate code for de developing machine learning models, like involving creating training and test data sets that might have similarities across different use cases. In any case, this ensures that all other DAG code is specific to that particular job. Lastly, so talking about tool specific code, I would argue that this is the most important of the three. So it's important here to talk about the concept of code abstraction, which entails wrapping particular pieces of logic into functions or classes. So to call these pieces of code, no copy pasting, but it's as simple as calling the functions by whatever name you choose. So how this relates to Airflow, I've created a DAG factory file, which includes functions for creating a DAG and adding a Python or a bash task to the DAG. This file can also be expanded to add different types of tasks and operators as well. But a few things to point out here. So first, when creating the DAG, Arguments can be provided, but the default args are supplied, are supplied in case no special changes are needed. This again allows us to not need to copy paste the exact same default arguments from file to file. As for the tasks, the, so the arguments have been abstracted and renamed to be kind of less Airflow specific. So for instance, task ID here is supplied into a name field and the Python callable on the Python operator is supplied into a function argument. So this is actually done very much on purpose um, to abstract away from Airflow naming conventions that again, if someone who isn't as familiar with Airflow, they just might not know. So 
what exactly does this get us? Well, the data declaration file then becomes unbelievably short. By calling these functions, it also becomes incredibly readable, even if you only know the very high level concepts in Airflow or honestly any just generic uh, pipeline ecosystem. Additionally, someone who wants to add a task uh, doesn't need to know whether the Python operator is used as a wrapper to call a bash script or the bash operator is used. I mean, honestly, I'm not completely sure when you do the former, but the point is that it doesn't really matter um, for someone implementing a new DAG. That decision is left for the data engineer most familiar with Airflow to decide on the nitty gritty details. And when implementing a job, the focus is what's specific to your company and the specific use case, which is the business logic. So there are a few ways to accomplish this type of abstraction. I've taken the most rudimentary approach for illustration, which is just defining functions in a file, but these functions could also be part of a class, a DAG factory class, for instance. And going even further, last year at the summit, actually, there was a talk on DAG factory, a pit package which allows you to declare DAGs and tasks in the YAML file. Today, I've focused and I'm trying to focus on the why, but highly recommend you to check that talk out as well. All of these approaches are kind of different flavors of the same concept, which is abstracting away from Airflow specific code so more people can contribute code and leverage the workflow orchestrator as the backbone of the analytics platform. So I would be remiss not to point out the idea of abstraction applies to not only Airflow, but other tools as well. Consider a change requiring updates to SQL queries, data tests, and some subsequent Python logic as well. In a large organization, the top experts on each of the topics aren't likely to be the same person. However, you may want all of their feedback on a PR implementing a change that touches all of these tools. For instance, if the Python code interacting with great expectations, validations, and checkpoints is abstracted, the reviewer can just focus on looking at the tests and making sure that all business logic is accounted for. But more on abstraction another day. So let's recap here. When contributing to or debugging code containing pipelines that run on Airflow, making the jump from the Airflow UI to where the code lives can be made extremely easy by some sort of intuitive folder structures and naming. Moreover, so keeping a separate folder with code used across DAGs ensures that there aren't any bugs introduced simply because of copy pasting code, like the game of broken telephone that I mentioned. So no one wants that in their professional lives, even if you do find that game incredibly entertaining. And lastly, not everyone needs to fully understand which operators are used in the Airflow DAG itself. Most contributors on the team need to understand what general type of task they're kicking off, whether it's a SQL query or a Python script. But keeping tool-specific code in one place makes contributors and PR reviewers more effective. And who doesn't want that? So on a final note, I hope that I've convinced you that abstraction and organization can be helpful at any scale and can prevent technical debt. And as for the specific solution implemented, that's certainly dependent on the use case. And now I thank you very much for your time and for tuning in and happy to turn to questions.